I'm excited to have on the Sick Career Podcast, Danielle Hughes. I met Danielle through Mutual Connections and learned about some of her special superpowers about branding individuals, giving them the sense of how to communicate their story. And Danielle, I'm going to just read a couple of sentences from your LinkedIn profile before I hand it over to you, because I think you brand yourself pretty darn well. Let me just read um, the first couple of uh, sentences here from your about section, which is awesome. Are you ready to attract the right clients and repel the wrong ones? Danielle helps individuals and organizations to develop their genuine personality brand. What's that, you ask? It means you get to own and embody your message, feel comfortable expressing it, and convey what makes you different from your competition. Pretty badass, right? I do think that's pretty badass, and that's why <laughs> Thank you. I'm inviting you here. So, Danielle, tell uh, the sick crowd a little bit about who you are and what got you into personal branding. Sure, absolutely. Um, I'm excited to be here. I just realized what S Y C K stood for. So uh... <laughs> steer your career with Kadima. I'm, wor but... I'm working on my branding, by the way. But so then no you said sick, and I was like, oh, sick, like. Like, like that's sick, like awesome, right? Yeah. Like very 80s. It's very 80s. Exactly. Not um, like COVID. Well, correct. Yeah, different kind of sick. Um, but yeah, so uh, my company is called More Than Words, and I am a copywriter by trade. I started out in marketing for television. So I worked at um, a bunch of different television networks back in the day, helping the salespeople get marketing materials to go out and sell programming. And I, what I realized is that I always had, even though I was doing business to business content, I always had a very warm, friendly, relatable tone to my copy. And back then sales copy was very salesy, very stiff, very formal. It wasn't human and it wasn't friendly. And so then I left and I went to a small agency where I was on the consumer side for many years. And then I was a freelance copywriter. So like a lot of people sort of in career transition who maybe make the break from corporate to their own thing, I just struck out on my own and was basically winging it for several years. And then I woke up one day and I was like, this is ridiculous. I was on that hamster wheel of taking everything that came my way, having no point of view, not really knowing the types of clients that I wanted to work with, not really having a clear vision for the type of work that I even wanted to do. And I ended up finding a creative coach who worked with me to create my business and in the process of working with her, she's kind of the one who kept pushing me to put more of me into my own messaging. So I like to say that I was my first client because even though I am quite personality driven and I'm very outgoing, like so many people, I was very reluctant to put that into my professional bio. And at some point I stumbled upon this concept of the differentiation between personal brand and personality brand, because to me, personal is private. So why would you share your personal information with the world? But our personality is who we are and it's on display all the time. And we just level it up and down depending on who we're interacting with. And so I started writing about what if we had a personality brand versus a personal brand and that started resonating with people. And the more I wrote about it, the more it resonated with others, the more I put myself into my own message. And the more I just started taking chances and taking risks and realizing that this was actually amazing, that I could be comfortable, that I could be myself, that the more I leaned into myself, the more I got the right types of clients who responded to my messaging and I had less of the wrong types of clients, because if somebody doesn't like your message, they're just not going to reach out. So it ends up doing the vetting for you, which is amazing. And then I started helping other people to do that. And that's what I do now is I help other people with their bios and their messaging. That, that's great. And I work with lots of clients. I was actually just speaking to someone earlier today. Very impressive background. Nine years at Google got promoted multiple times, data analytics person, manager, large team. And he's like, I don't know how to market myself. I don't know how to talk about myself to other companies. 
how, like, obviously you don't know this individual, but I get those challenges all the time of working with clients that are trying to market themselves to employers that are going to pay them good money, potential employers that are going to pay Mm -hmm. them good money. What, what are some pieces of advice that you have for people, like as you work with them to develop their personality brand? So the, it's interesting that you mentioned this because I had a client um, last week who came to me for work on his resume and his LinkedIn, very accomplished professional, multiple degrees, you know, engineer, biomechanical, biomedical, also finance, also tech, like a resume that is super impressive but it was just a whole bunch of jargon, right? Like you looked at his stuff and I'm like, nothing is standing out to me. You're so impressive. You're burying everything you've ever done. He didn't have like a little description at the top. So the first step is to take a step back and kind of ask yourself, what do you want people to know about you? Because I think a lot of people, especially when you have these long, impressive histories and these amazing backgrounds, we feel the need to put everything in and it becomes super cluttered and it doesn't become targeted. And so the first thing is, what's no longer serving you? What have you done in your past that you just don't need to share, don't need to talk about? What are you most proud of? And more importantly, I always say it's not just what you do, it's how do you do it? What is it about the way that you approach your job that is going to be a benefit to another organization? And I think so many people come at their resume and they come at their bio from a me, me, me perspective, and it's about you, but it's for them. So how do you shift the framework to a service message? I am amazing because I help organizations do X, Y, and Z. So quantifying your accomplishments in the framework of how this will benefit your future employer. Great. And I believe you have a background of copywriting. And what's like, I find a resume or LinkedIn or your narrative essentially being your own personal copy that you're writing for a um, someone who's listening to that, either viewing it or listening to it, how, how would you connect your background in copywriting to how you help people brand themselves, uh, their personality and their personal brand? Like, well, uh, so it depends. Co- common attributes with that? I mean, I think, you know, copywriting is communication, right? So I'm always going to come at it from a words first perspective. But it's also about like kind of shifting the focus yet the words are important and but i think a lot of us rely on like these jargony terms and all of this filler and this clutter language that just doesn't just gets in the way of who we are so even though i am like a wordsmith i always talk to my clients and say how do we tell your story in the most simple like like how would you tell your job to a five-year-old go Good luck, right? No one can do right. it. They people stumble. Uh, 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 it's like you know, you're so reliant on. I'm a change management leader who services blah blah blah. But if you can step back and like break it down into the most simplest basic terms, you get to the crux of what it is, and then you can infuse the language. But I think because my background is in is in communication, I always think about the audience. So yes, my clients come to me for them. I'm less concerned about them and more concerned about who they want to attract. And we come at it from that perspective. How do you frame your language to be an attractor, not just an explainer? And and, right. And I think that's a great point of how, not just what you're saying, but how you can communicate so people can hear the words. And there's this adage of communication is not what you say, but what you, what people hear. Right. Or what it evokes, right? The emotion that it evokes, the feeling that it evokes. Right. But it has to be comprehended by that individual, either seen on a resume, uh, seen on a LinkedIn profile, listened to in a narrative. Um, What are the, like, as you work with individuals, what are some of those key touch points? Like those are the three key touch points that I think about in terms Mm. of personal branding and marketing yourself to a future employer or something like that, like your LinkedIn profile, your resume, 
and then TMAY, tell me about yourself. Um, are, are those the three primary areas, like the mediums of communication that you, you see for people that are either searching for a job or trying to advance their career in their current job? Yeah, I mean, I, I work with a lot of um, like freelancers or solopreneurs or entrepreneurs. So I would add like the about page on your website to that. But yes, it is about your bio in whatever form it is. And if you're an employee, your in, your internal bio that's on your company's intranet, your your um, social media profiles, right? Yes, we have LinkedIn, but you've got your smaller bios. And then that, like you said, the tell me about yourself, the elevator pitch. How do you introduce yourself? How do you talk about what you do? And how do we make that feel authentically you? And to me, this is about a conversation. You know, it's it doesn't always have to lead with, you know, when people say, what do you do? Most people respond with their job title. But your job title has nothing to do with what you do, right? That job was written for someone, not you. It was written for anybody to fill a role and do a bunch of tasks. And how you embody that and approach it is going to be very different than the person before you and the person after you. And so this is how you reframe your narrative to say, this is how I approach my job. This is the value that I bring. And again, always framing all of these things in service. So it's not just I do X, Y, and Z. It's, you know, companies today struggle with the speed of economy. That's why I blah, blah, blah. Right. So kind of really coming at it like a marketer, but in a way that is going to attract that audience and make them say, okay, this person understands what we need. I need to know more about them. And then it's infusing that personal detail that makes you a well-rounded human being. And I always insist that my clients put something personal in their bio. And when I say personal, I mean a hobby, a passion, whatever it is that you want to talk about all damn day that lights you up and gets you so excited. And then we try to frame that in the context of your job and how you approach your job. And that personal antidote I find to be so valuable. Someone told me that a few years back and I started implementing it. So whenever I go off about my career, I always end. And on a personal note, I'm from Brooklyn, New Yorker all my life. I have three kids, two dogs, three birds, and one unbelievably supportive wife. And that almost always gets people talking about pets of like, oh, what type of birds do you have? What type of dog do you have? Even though I told them everything else about me. Before Correct. that, they forget everything. And everything. Then they get to that personal aspect, and you you start with that rapport building instantaneously. And and you just hit the nail on the head. Like I think we forget that we're trying to connect, and like you can't connect over your tasks and your job. You connect over the stuff that's relatable to people. And they want to know, right? It's like, tell them what you do for your fitness. Tell them the movies that you love, the music that you get into, the food that you like to cook. You know, I talk about wine in my bio. I joke that I accept payments in bottles of Bordeaux or yes. wine with any letter. I, almost everyone I talk to wants to talk about wine. Even if they're not into wine, I'll have people be like, I know you love wine. Like, I'm a craft beer guy. I'm like, great. Let's talk about craft beer. Yeah. It starts the conversation, right? And you just... You instantly feel less stressed. You don't have to perform and you can just start talking about something you love and then you can get into the professional stuff. Yeah. And, and that's great. So as I work with my clients, I always tell them that an interview is consists of four phases. The first part is rapport building. Like you get on the call with someone and you talk about the weather, you talk about some commonality or something like that. The second part, which I want to dig into with you, is a TMAY, the tell me about yourself or walk me through your resume or the narrative. Then the third part are questions I have for you and I prepare people for that. And the fourth part, the fourth phase is what questions do you have for us, the company? Of course. That's essentially right. how every interview goes. Yes. But that narrative, the TMAY, is something that is often very intimidating for people, uh, mm -hmm. very nerve wracking, it prevents people from taking action on applying and interviewing. So it, I, I have some guides that I give people for that TMAY, but I would love your advice. You are a trained professional in this. People pay you a shit ton of money for your expertise here. If I was like, like, as I'm working with my clients for that two, 
well, I won't even tell them the time that I, I give them a time frame. Sure. But on that, tell me about yourself. How would you guide people on how to effectively nail that one phase out of the four phases of the interview? I mean, I always like to lead with a story and like a story that is going to get somebody sucked in. Right. So, and this is different for everybody. It could be that you've had a dream to be X, Y, and Z since you were a kid and that your first experience to something was, you know, with a parent or, or something where you're kind of starting the story. Like I had a woman who teaches um, like confidence training and, um, and speaking. And she said that at like nine years old, her school principal had like paraded her around the school because she was a performer to sing and made her get up on a desk and sing to all the other kids. So at nine years old, she already felt this like thrill of performing and the applause and what that could feel like. And that set the tone for her entire career. Like to me, it's like somebody starts a story with like, when I was nine years old, this I'm leaning in tell me more. Like, I don't even want to talk about the interview. Like I, I need more about this. So it's the personal, as long as it relates to the professional and everybody's story is different. I had a client recently who told me that she's a vinyl connoisseur. She collects vinyl. So she likes to go to record stores, dig through the bins and find records. And she does like change management and like proving process and systems. And so her story is like she thinks about the systems of an organization like hunting for that deep cut in a record store. And so instantly that person has a visual of her sifting through records, but how it relates to her job. And you instantly, A, will remember this person, but B, she's more interesting. And now C, you understand a little bit about how her brain works and how she's going to approach the role. That, that's amazing. Um, and people do remember stories. I give lots of talks. I give lots of numbers, lots of facts, and people come back to me and tell me about, oh, they, they, they come back to the story about how I got fired from Google or how, whatever, I, I dealt with some challenging situation somewhere. They, they talk about the stories that I tell. Um, what? So I tend to give people very specific guidance in terms of how much time mm -hmm. they should set aside for that so that they are not boring people. Um, and some other tips or like some tips that I give, and I would love your feedback on these. Sure. I was like, I tell people, keep it two to four minutes max. Um, and also I say, talk about like how your background aligns with the company that you're talking about. So like look on their values page and understand yep. if you're looking at Stripe, oh, they want to solve big problems. So you like solving big problems. You don't have to pull off every part of the value there, but relate it back to there and also relate why you are particularly a good fit and interested in this role. Um, so you could probably have a, like that, that's the general advice I give. I do not talk about the story, which I really like that aspect. Mm. Um, what do you think about the tips that I'm giving there and how would you tweak that or enhance that based on your, I, I think very spot on um, evaluation that stories really draw people in and help to influence people? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, a hundred percent, you need to be able to read the room, right? So I think a story can be compelling at 10 minutes long and it can be painful at 10 seconds long. And you have to understand, you have to be able to see, is the person across from you engaged in what you have to say? And if they're not, obviously cut it off, rework it, et cetera. So that's one, like, I think giving someone two to four minutes two even seems long to me for like, just the, tell me about yourself. I think, tell me about yourself 60 seconds, maybe. And then if it, then if they want to ask more, they ask more and then you can go on. But that seems to me to be like 60 seconds to two minutes. That's a long time to talk. Okay. Right. I think, but again, I think it depends on the person and I think it depends on your ability to weave your narrative and the engagement of the other person. I also think you have to respect the time of these interviewers who are probably doing back to back to back interviews with so many people and are probably exhausted. Um, oh, and then I had another point I was going to say that you just brought up that I thought was so spot on. About tying it back to the values of the company or the relevancy oh, of the yes. role. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So I think one thing I like to remind people of is you're in as much control as they are. I think so many times when people go in to interview for a job, you're leading from that fear mindset of, will they like me? 
And it's so important to recognize that you have to like them too, that their values do need to align with you, that you have a choice in this, in this matter. And, you know, we're taking out the people that just need a job, like money's tight and I got to get a job and I can't worry about it. But if you are someone that's coming from a very high paying job and you have the luxury to kind of be a little choosy, I would say, make sure that you're going to go into the organization that's going to be a good fit for you. And so to your point, do look at their values, but also like go poke around LinkedIn, look at the people that work there. Do they have bios that suggest that they're happy at this organization? Is things cohesive? Does it look like this organization is a mess? Do they feature their people on the website, right? That's going to also show you if you're going to go into a situation where you're going to be supported and welcomed for your individuality. Do they really walk the walk or are they just talking the talk about we want diverse mindset and diverse voices? Because I think a lot of people are just kind of whitewashing that right now. and. I would say just do your homework for sure. Totally agreed with that. So I, I've been telling people to talk a little bit too much about themselves, uh, perhaps in two to four minutes. And there's three primary ways that I feel that people are communicating their story to the company that they're trying to get into. Uh, the, the tell me about yourself, the narrative, the resume, the LinkedIn, everything else then is like interactive once you get yeah. there. Uh, what, um, are there any other channels that you focus on for like a cohesive story and, uh, personal branding of clients that you work with that I'm missing out on? And like, I, you, you talked about some solopreneurs or freelancers. Yeah. They sure. have their website also. That's usually rare. Uh, like maybe for some design or creative type of roles that people are applying for, they need their portfolio. Um, but, but for, for the typical person who's looking to get a sales job at Spotify or trying to get a customer success role at Salesforce. I think of those three pieces primarily. Um, and assuming that that is what, uh, what advice do you have for that whole package of, um, yeah, like those three primary pillars of what is marketing your story? So I would say it should all be cohesive, right? You shouldn't have three separate stories on each different piece of paper or platform. Um, I think it used to be that the tone should be different on like social versus resume versus LinkedIn. And, but I feel like everything is kind of becoming a little bit more intertwined and you can be a little friendlier on your resume. You can be a little friendlier on LinkedIn. So I don't feel like you have to be formal in one place and casual in another. Um, again, I think what it always leads with warm and relatable, you know, so many people on their resume, even the top, they don't use the word I, it's just like leader with blah, blah, blah. And like you talk about yourself in fragmented sentences, you could tell a story there. You could lead with I, you could lead with your organization as if you're talking to the potential future employer and then how you're uniquely qualified. To me, all of these pieces are starting a conversation. You want someone to feel like you are having a conversation with them as opposed to talking at them. It's talking with them. And I think that goes back to the, the interview as well. When I said, keep it shorter, it's more of a conversation. If they ask you something and you answer, then they ask you something and you go on for four minutes. That's a soliloquy, mm -hmm. right? So it, it, again, it's just bringing more of that warmth back. Like if this person, you know, I can work with this person. We can talk. It's conversational. It's easy. It's flowing as opposed to, wow, that person just went on for ages and ages. And then that's a lot of times that's nerves as well to just keep running on. Yeah. So I, yeah. In addition to um, the narrative or the tell me about yourself, that could be too lengthy. And people make errors with that, like myself included, telling people to go up to four minutes. And you're saying that's no, too long. I'm I mean, but the, the right person, that's super <laughs> yeah. engaging. Again, it depends on the person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. What are some other common potential mistakes or myths that people have with when they're conveying their narrative, uh, when people are, when they're trying to essentially sell themselves, market themselves? I, I call it rent themselves because I think people are talent as a service. So you're essentially yes. getting in uh, like a weekly pay or a monthly pay uh, for in return for your value. But what, what are some other common um, 
uh, issues that people have or myths that they have. Like when people come to you, you're like, okay, these are obvious tweaks that you need to make right away. Mm -hmm. So I think the number one thing that I see is that we downplay our own strengths. We tend to take the things that we do well for granted. And so we don't even talk about them and we don't showcase them. And if you can do something well, and it comes so easily to you, that is a skill that will be valued by the right employer. And so I like to tell a lot of my clients, go ask five people in your life for three words that come to mind when they think of you. And that should be personal and professional, different kinds of people. And 100%, you either get the same word or similar words that come back from multiple people. And that word speaks to a value that you have or an ability or personality trait that you have that other people not only recognize, but praise and and value. And you need to communicate that to a future employer. And, you know, people will say, oh, well, everybody told me I was thoughtful. And like, so what? Okay. Thoughtful means you might be the person who's in a meeting, who's recognizing someone who's not getting called on, who should be, who's in the back, who's not raising their hand. And so you might say to your boss, I think we should support so-and-so, or I think so-and-so might want something to say. Or if you're the person that everybody says, well, you know, you're just the most on time person, maybe you should be in charge of running the meeting because you're going to make sure everybody gets in and gets out in a timely manner, right? So figuring out how these things that you do well and just easily is going to be a benefit to someone and putting that into your message. Yeah. And getting that feedback is so valuable. I, I often tell people, people come to me and ask, what sort of job should I be going for? I was like, well, go out and talk to people, ask, like, give them a little insight about what you're doing, or if people know what you're doing, ask them where you think that my strengths are and where I can play to my strengths. And it's all, I, I think to your point, it is talking about the strengths. And on the flip side, I get a lot of um, questions about people about like, oh, I just got laid off. How do I communicate that to mm. an employer? Or I had a difficult boss. I don't want to complain about that boss. Like, how do I avoid that? I, I give some advice on that, but I would like your thoughts on how, how you navigate difficult news. Like maybe you got laid off, you were unemployed for a while, you had a really shitty boss, whatever. How, how do you tell people to handle that? Well, so the, I think, you know, the shitty boss, I think you can say that it was a challenging environment. And I think that probably alludes yeah. to what was going on. I think most people now know that when somebody leaves an organization, it's usually because they weren't supported by their manager, right? Like we don't leave a good job. That's just not the case, right? You leave a job because you don't feel supported and you don't feel valued. So, you know, that should also be something that were there red flags? Like, should you do some thinking on your own? Were there red flags ahead of time that you didn't pick up on that, should have made you think I shouldn't take this job. This person's not a good fit for me. This boss is not going to support me. Granted, if somebody got promoted in or your boss is a different person, there's not a lot you can do about that. Um, in terms of like getting laid off or any like gaps, which I hate that term, it's, it happens. Like just own it. You know, everybody's been out of work at some point. Everybody's been fired. Everybody's been laid off. Like these things are not unique. And I think, we make too much of them and we get so concerned and it's just like, yeah, you know, they downsized. And so I was out of work for a while and I did X, Y, and Z during this time and turn it on its head. Right. So, you know, especially for women who are like, well, I stayed home and I took care of my kids. I'm like, great. You were the CEO of your household. You planned all the budgets. You managed your kids' schedules. Like these things are like real value to the right organization. That's like this person's organized. This person can multitask. This person can do all these things. So I think if you own it instead of shy away from it, it's much more respected. And it also shows that you don't have any shame, right? We, you can't control these things that have happened to you, but now you can control how you talk about them. I think that's great. I, I also tell people that they don't have to proactively bring this stuff up. Agreed. If questions are asked, you need to be prepared on how to answer it. Yes. But you don't need to say you were laid off from your past job. You don't even need to bring up that you had a gap like eight years ago for two yes. years. Like if they're, if they're not going to notice it, which they likely will not, there's no need for you to bring that up, even if you do have a good story for it. 
Correct. And you and I both know, I think, what does a recruiter spend seven seconds looking at your resume, right? I yeah, mean, I've it's heard six to 60 seconds and it's cool. probably closer to six. Yeah, correct. So it's like, again, like we all think everybody cares much more about us than they actually do. And so if you kind of go in with that same thing, don't bring it up. And if they say, oh, I see that you, you know, have a gap here or whatever. Oh, my company downsized. I got laid off. You know, I had some severance. So I took some time, I blah, blah, blah. And now I'm excited to start over or to start something new. And I feel refreshed and energized. And, you know, you can make it into a positive for sure. Yeah. And that point that you just said there, where people think that people are paying more attention to them than they really are, is so true. People are afraid to make an update on their LinkedIn profile because what's their boss going to say or what's someone at the company going to say? First off, there's ways to not update Hide everybody that. about that. Correct. But secondly, secondly, people are not even looking at your profile. Like, like they don't give a shit as much about you. Like, and I have people that work on their resume for hours and weeks and i was like just get it good enough like get it like you want it to ha be objectively perfect you don't want typos you want it to be easy to read you want to have a uh, effective story there but then just be done with it and then Agreed. move on to the next thing and i would also argue that you should be updating your linkedin while you're happy at a job right and yes, i go definitely. in now and i teach employees and companies that they should be encouraging their employees to brand their LinkedIn while they're at an organization, because that's marketing for your company, right? If you are happy at your job, you changing your LinkedIn is not a threat to your organization. It's a benefit because now other people are going to see that and think, I want to work here. So if, if you want to update your LinkedIn and somebody raises a question, you can say, Hey, I'm, I'm, I want people to know what I'm up to. I want them to know what I'm doing here. And I am promoting, I'm an ambassador for this organization. Yeah, that, that's great. So we're ending, uh, we're running a little low on time, but just want to hear any last tips you have when to help people gain the confidence and the support, any tricks that you give people about um, r really helping to brand themselves so that they're more confident and successful in achieving their goals. So any last tips you want to share with uh, the sick audience here? Sure. <laughs> Um, I would just say, I know it feels scary to put yourself out there, but the more you do it, the more comfortable and confident you will actually be. It's actually harder to hide yourself and live hiding and not be, not feel like you can be who you are than it is to be your, put yourself out there. And again, just know that you're not going to be for everybody and that's okay. You don't have to be, but the more true you are to yourself, the more likely you are to find an organization that appreciates that, respects that and values that. And isn't that the whole point? And, and putting yourself out there, getting out there, practice it. And maybe you'll, you'll fumble the first mm -hmm. time. You, ideally you practice. Are, are there ways that you have people practice before they actually go out into game time? and share their story to internally to a senior leader or for interview? Are, are there ways that you work with your clients or advise people to, to practice effectively before they're just thrown into the deep end? Yeah. I mean, I would, I always tell people you have to read your stuff out loud. Even if you're reading your bio verbatim, read it out loud several times because that's going to see what feels natural, where you get tripped up, what's not clear. And then in terms of like your elevator pitch, you could practice in front of the mirror. You could record yourself on your phone and play it back. And it's, it's going to be tough and it's going to be awkward and you're going to hate it. But if you just do it over and over again, eventually you'll find that rhythm. You'll find that cadence and ask people if you can practice on them, right? Call up a friend, yeah. ask your spouse, whoever, and say, Hey, can I run this by you and just pitch them and see how it goes and ask them to be, to give you some radical candor, right? You don't need them to pat you on the head. Don't do it with your mom because she's not going to tell you the truth. Find someone who's going to tell you the truth. That's a great point. I actually ask, I give this option to my clients and I probably should mandate it more of letting them to record their narrative. And I say, yes. give me two to four minutes, no more. Record it, send it to me. I know it's going to sound odd to you. It's going to be uncomfortable, but it's better than cutting your teeth in front of Google or in front of Amazon or something like that. It's amazing how many people will not do that. So it's a lot. Yeah. It's a, 
what were you going to say about that? No, I was just going to say, and like, if you can't do that, then how are you going to go into the interview? Right. If you can't record yeah. yourself and send it to someone who you've paid, who you trust, how are you going to do it with a stranger? And you will never get that feedback from the interviewer because Correct. the interviewer is either going to hire you in a small number of cases or pass on you. And when you ask for feedback, they're not going to give you feedback. Correct. And if they do give you feedback, the feedback will be, oh, we just went with someone else. Correct. They we went are... in another direction. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Even though the narrative and like the, the story is important. I've only given feedback to, to one person. And this is actually a funny antidote. When I was at Google one year, I was interviewing 225 people throughout the course of the year. Wow. So I was doing lots of these interviews. I was building my team from 40 to 80 people. And the first question, I would always tell them about myself. And I would try to mirror something and do it in like two to three minutes. And I'd say, oh, okay, tell me about yourself or walk me through your resume. This one kid, and I say he's a kid because he was like one year out of school, went on for 17 minutes. And I know that because I started oh to like watch the time and I was like surfing oh the God. internet. I was like checking ESPN or some other site at the time. And the guy was one year out of school. And he was telling me about how he was a treasurer in his fraternity in school <laughs> and all this stuff. I was like, dude. And then um, my next question for him was, was like, okay, well, what questions do you have for me? Because I was done. I was like, mm. this guy's going to lose it. And then he asked me, well, what advice do you have for millennials who are going into career, uh, their early careers? I was like, practice your interview skills. <laughs> Don't take 17 and minutes. <laughs> I, I, I didn't give him the specificity of that. Yeah. I was like, take these interviews seriously. Yeah. And that was the last of the conversation. And, and after that, I actually tweaked that question to say, tell me about yourself in three minutes or less. There you go. And that actually, like people did not adhere to it, but I think a lot more people adhere to it when I gave them a little bit of guidance. Yeah. And I think, you know, there, there's a little bit of framing here, right? If you, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people who don't like networking and I'm like, don't, don't think of it as networking. Think of it as connecting, as just is having a conversation. And I think it's the same thing with the interview. The minute we think we're going to be interviewed, it sends like a message to the brain. We're going to be grilled. They're going to ask us all these things. But if you treat it like just a conversation to learn more about you and you to learn more about them, you can go in with a little bit less pressure. And maybe that makes you feel more comfortable and will allow you to have a little bit more breathing room in how you talk and how they talk. And it might just feel more natural. And you might actually get the job. Yep. Cool, Danielle. So the very last question I have is, how can people find you? If they want to mm -hmm. work with you or follow what you produce out there. What, what's the best way to contact you? So they could come to my website, which is morethanwordscopy.com. You can find me on LinkedIn at Danielle Hughes. Instagram is Danielle Z Hughes, all the things. And I do have a newsletter that goes out every other week. That's all about personality, branding, and and voice and tone. So you can sign up for that on my website too. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights, your wisdom, your brand story. I will figure out some way to pay you back in Bordeaux. For some <laughs> Amazing. To, to, <laughs> thank to you. appreciate you for your <laughs> generosity. And uh, yeah, thanks for sharing all your wisdom with uh, the Sick Career audience here. Thank you so much. It was great, Alan. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Daniel. 